Our reading this morning is taken from John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, and then John chapter 8, verse 12. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then chapter 8, verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Amen. Thank you, Val. Let us pray. Father God, as we reflect on your word and on these encouraging words that you are the light of the world, we pray that you would speak right to our hearts, uh, to exactly where you are wanting to shine light in our lives this morning. Amen. <clears throat> Friends, I hope you've been enjoying the, uh, the sermon series as much as I have so far uh, as we explore these statements that Jesus made, I am, and they provide us an opportunity to, to know God in an in a ever-increasingly deep way. Of course, I don't think it's ever possible to fully know God, uh, but the, the, the joy for me of, of these statements that Jesus makes is it's like he, he tries to explain something so mysterious, so beyond our understanding, using simple analogies. Simple analogies like, I am the bread of life. I am light. I am the vine. And very often I, I experience uh, in, in, through, through, through teaching in church that, that the things we say, not everything sticks for everyone. But something sticks for someone, and, and for each person, something will stick, if that makes sense. And that's the beauty of this series, that, that perhaps there are going to be certain elements that really speak to you today. But, but light, this idea of Jesus being the light of the world, it almost goes beyond that, because it's a concept that we all understand, that we all can relate to. Last week, uh, when, when Ian was, was sharing with us, he, he gave us a little insight into uh, some, some theological concepts, and he was speaking about Christology, if you remember, and how um, we get this kind of high Christology and low Christology, uh, where, where we understand that, that Jesus was fully God and fully human, and sometimes we might focus more on the fully God part, and other times more on the fully human part. Uh, sometimes we, we, we read in Scripture, particularly in John's Gospel, these, these, these much higher understandings of, 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 God, of Jesus as God. And on other occasions, particularly in some of the other uh, Gospels, we learn about the, the much more tangible hands and feet version of Jesus. But what I find interesting when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, is that for me at least it feels like the link between those two. It feels like this high and powerful and majestic God has come right into our lives. If you think of the sun, the sun is, is, is much bigger than our earth, and yet its rays come into our space, into our lives, into the air. It warms us, and it becomes part of us. It's ever-present. It's it's like we can almost touch it. So this morning I want to, as we prepare to talk about Jesus as the light of the world, I want you to start by thinking about what your darkness is. Because light is often best understood when we first understand the darkness that it might overcome. And I want to sort of reflect on this throughout my message in, in, in kind of three levels. Uh, the first one being the level of, of the world. Maybe it's our country, maybe it's the world around us. Do you find yourself overwhelmed by a sense of, of hopelessness for our world and our country? When you watch the news, do you find it depressing? 
Do you worry about the world that you're leaving for your children and your grandchildren? Do you find that it's as if we are all living in dark times? Is that the type of language you hear around the dinner table, around the braai at, at the office? Do you find that the problems of this world choke you and prevent you from finding joy? Darkness can also exist in our lives as individuals. And so do you find yourself sometimes feeling lost, as if you're in the darkness, you don't know which way you are going, not sure where your life is going or where your life is meant to go? Do you find that you're not even sure sometimes what the next steps should be? Or perhaps for you, it's the final level, which is even more deep into our individual lives. Have you suffered personal loss, pain, hurt? Do you have scars? Do you have wounds? Does it feel like sometimes those things become a darkness that takes over your life? So we may find darkness in, in each of these three areas, in the sense of, of our world, of our country, of where we're going, as individuals trying to find our way in life. And we may find darkness in those events, those painful events that sometimes occur in our lives. Now when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, he is saying a lot. He is saying a lot. He is offering himself as the one who was fully God and fully human. He is offering himself not just as some quick fix solution to our struggles here on earth, but as a completely different way of understanding our world, of understanding our lives, and of understanding our brokenness. And so I want to, on using those levels, reflect this morning on, on three different ways that we can think about light, that we can think about Jesus as, as light in our lives, in our world, in our brokenness. And then I'm going to conclude with a fourth thought, which is, is, is kind of that, that twist at the end of the movie. Uh, and I'm not going to say too much about it, but only to say that this twist was a twist that actually was an awakening for me as I was preparing this message. And in fact, even contradicts what I wrote to you in the, the bulletin letter this week because I wrote that before I'd finished my preparation. So I'll leave that as something to look forward to at the end. But three ways that we can think about light, considering those three different levels. The first one is that that when we think about hopelessness or darkness in our world, light has the potential to overcome that darkness. When Jesus says, I am the light of the world, he is bringing hope to the world. In, that, in, the, in the first passage that we, that we uh, heard read to us earlier, the writer of John says, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. When Jesus came in, into this world, he was coming into, into a dark world, a world that was far more difficult than even what we experience today. It was a world full of oppression, a world of hardship. And he brought light, he brought hope. But it's the same light and the same hope that we can experience when we reflect on our world today. When we look at the challenges that our, our world is facing, Jesus brings the promise that things can get better. He bring, brings the promise that things do get better. He brings the promise that God is working in all situations for the good. As Christians, we live in the light, and so we should live full of hope and joy for our world. When, when we see darkness in our world, we should not respond with negativity, 
but we should rather respond by bringing light, by bringing hope. We have an understanding that God is building his kingdom here on earth. It is not fully formed. It is not fully complete. But it is being built. And we have the invitation to be a part of that. The second level where light shines is into our lives. And in this sense, we, we can understand uh, firstly that that. that Jesus is the light of the world. He is lighting up our lives, lighting up the way, giving us a sense of direction. When Jesus spoke those words, I am the light of the world, and, and, we, and we heard them read from, from John's gospel from, from chapter 8 a little bit earlier, the context in which he spoke those words was, in the, it was during the Jewish festival Uh, the the festival of tabernacles, or sometimes referred to as the festival of booths. Uh, This was a a festival which is in fact still celebrated to this day by by Jewish people. And the festival was all about remembering the time when the Israelites lived in the desert and where they would build temporary structures to sleep under, to eat in, but then they would have to pack them up quickly because they were always on the move. And so this festival was a reminder of those times and, and to remind the, the, the Jewish nation of how amazing it is to have a permanent home, uh, to have a place to, to live and call your own. And so what they would do uh, during this festival, and, and as still happens in Israel, they, they would build these temporary structures, perhaps we can think of it like a tent, <laughs> And as families, they would live in that for a week and they would eat together in that space and they would pray together in that space. But one of the interesting things that happened during the Festival of Tabernacles was also that at night, great torches would be lit which would, would, would light up the whole of, of Jerusalem. And these torches were lit to remind the Israelites of how God gave them the d- direction in the deserts. If you remember the, the, the story in, in Exodus of how when the Israelites were moving through the desert, God always puts up during the day a pillar of cloud, but at night a pillar of fire to direct their ways and to show them the way to, to move. And so during the festival of tabernacles, uh, the Jewish people would, ha, would, would, would light these torches, these giant torches which would light up all of Jerusalem. And it was a reminder of how God had always lit their way, had always shown them a sense of direction. And it's in this context that Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I am the light. Now, sometimes light gives us direction by being far in the distance. Other times, light may be literally just shining, the, shining ahead of us for the next step. One of the best illustrations that I've ever heard of light in the distance is the experience of a scuba diver who, who gets into very rough water or, or, or into something of a whirlpool and is, is getting tossed around in the water and they're going deeper and they don't know which way is up. But you know the way that, that they figure out which way is up even though they have no sense of up and down? It's by looking for light, because the light is the way that is up. And so sometimes in our lives, God shines light into our lives in a way that helps us. He puts it up ahead and reminds us, it helps us to know which way to go, what's the destination, where are we heading. Other times it's more like uh, what, what some people would call a, a flashlight faith, <laughs> where we have our torch, if you've ever hiked in, in the darkness, and, you, and you, you, you can't necessarily see where you're going, but you can, with the torch, just see the next step. And in this sense, the light provides direction for, for one step at a time. And perhaps you're following a path, and that, that, that one step at a time simply gives you the assurance that you are still on the path. So sometimes... God uses light in our lives. He he brings us a sense of direction, not for the long term, but for the next step. 
And as we continue the journey of faith, it's this constant balance between these two, knowing that there is a place that God is taking us to in the distance, but that there's a next step that we need to take. And so perhaps this morning you want to reflect on what your next step might be, but also on your calling. What has God called you to? Where do you, do you believe he wants you to go? What do you believe he wants you to do with your life? The third level is that one of brokenness, that one of pain, that one of wounds in our lives. And certainly in my experience of, of, of working in the church, uh, I, I came to really understand that, that somehow being able to, to show God's light, it's most possible to do that when there's brokenness. When we, are, when we are able to bring Christ's love, Christ's peace, Christ's hope to a personal group of people <clears throat> who are in a place of brokenness. There's a band uh, that, that I enjoy called Switchfoot. Uh, I'm guessing not too many of you listen to them on a regular basis. They're a, a Christian rock band. Well, they wouldn't say they're Christian, but they, they, they're Christian people who are in a rock band, shall we put it that way. <laughs> And so they have this, this really encouraging messaging in their, in their lyrics very often. And they have this song where they sing these words. They say, the wound is where the light shines through. The wound is where the light shines through. And it's a beautiful reminder of how Jesus is able to bring real tangible light into the lives of those who are hurting, those who are sick those who are bereaved, those who are hungry, those who are broken. He did that when he was here on earth through his ministry and the way he touched lives, the way he healed. But he does that for us today too. And while it is possible to experience Christ's light in our lives at any time of our lives, there is something about the hardest times that makes the light shine more vividly, more impactfully. And so as Jesus says to us, I am the light of the world, we can be reminded of the fact that he brings hope to, to the world as a whole, that he brings direction to our own lives as individuals, but also that he is able to, to shine into even those, those, those hardest, most broken, dark times that we go through. But now for the final thought. And this is the part where I said, I came to a realization, which I should have known as somebody who studied theology and so on, but sometimes God reveals something to you, corrects something in your thinking, or, or brings you to a new understanding. You see, even in my message, even in the letter that I wrote to you in the bulletin, I, I, I mentioned this idea of the fact that we are called to reflect God's light. Uh, I, I remember, I think this is probably part of my formative years as a Christian, uh, hearing uh, 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 somebody give a talk, perhaps when I was a teenager, about how we can think of ourselves as something like the moon, how the moon reflects light that the sun shines and the moon reflects light, so even at night we still see light. And that's a beautiful illustration. But I'm not sure it's quite right. You see, Jesus comes to us into our lives as the light of the world, and he invites us to, to live in his light. But living in the light comes with it with a certain responsibility. And interestingly, in one of the other Gospels, there are some words written which you will be very familiar with that tells us what our role is when we live in his light. These words won't be on the screen, but I just want to read them to you from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, part of the, the, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, verses 14 to 16. So now remember in John's Gospel, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. In Matthew's Gospel, and it's a different moment, 
but he says these words. You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and give light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your, God, your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Not simply reflecting his light, but actually receiving that light, allowing it to take hold in you, to be a part of your life, so that it turns you into a light. And I love that illustration of, of, of being a city on, on, a, on the hill, because perhaps as individuals we'll feel, but no, but my light is too small. Well, no, your light is powerful and it's given by, by God and, and, and its source is, is, is Jesus, the light of the world. But when we have many individual lights shining, it's like a city on a hill and all can see and all can know. And isn't that ultimately the role of us as a church? To be individuals who've, who live in the light who find hope through that light, who allow our lives to be directed by that light, who use that light to, to, bring, to bring particularly um, um, love and, and peace into places of brokenness, but ultimately people who together are like a city on a hill shining brightly that all may see the hope that we have in Jesus. And so my prayer for all of us this morning is that we would experience Christ's light overcoming our darkness, lighting our way, and shining in the midst of our brokenness. And may that light come to live inside of each one of you so that you too may be a light to the world. Let us pray. Father God, ever since some of us were in Sunday school, we've sung that song, This Little Light of Mine, I'm Gonna Let It Shine. And yet, somehow, in as much as we, we sang those words and we believed them as a child, as, as our lives have continued on, we've started to learn about how hard the world is, about how not everyone wants to shine their light, about how bad things happen even to good people. But Lord Jesus, in this moment, would you humble us? Would you help us to become somewhat childlike again? And remember first that your light shines into our lives and gives us hope, gives us direction, but also that you call us to be little lights that shine brightly for you in this world. Lord, as we continue on this journey of reflecting on who you are through these statements of I am that you made, Lord, would you help us as we come to know you better to also know who we are in you, and particularly today the fact that we are your lights shining in this world, giving hope, and being a part of establishing your kingdom here on earth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.